Welcome to CMO Confidential, the podcast that takes you inside the drama, decisions, and choices that go with being the head of marketing. Hosted by five-time CMO, Mike Linton. Welcome marketers, advertisers, and those who love them, the Chief Marketing Officer Confidential. CMO Confidential is a program that takes you inside the drama, the decisions, and the politics that go with being the head of marketing at any company in what is one of the most scrutinized jobs in the executive suite. I'm Mike Linton, the former Chief Marketing Officer of Best Buy, eBay, Farmers Insurance, and Ancestry.com, here today with my guest, Dr. Peter Fader. Today's topic, ignore customer data at your own peril. It's the secret sauce for growth. Peter is a marketing professor at the Wharton School of Business at the University of Pennsylvania. He's been teaching there for over 30 years. He founded a predictive analytics firm called Zodia, which he sold to Nike in 2018, and also founded another analytics firm called Theta. His specialty is consumer-driven focus and includes work on lifetime value, customer relationships, and customer-based corporation valuation. A lot of customer stuff in there. I'm very excited to have him on the show to cover these important topics. Welcome, Peter. It's great to talk to you, Mike. Just really happy to help spread the gospel about all this customer stuff. All these customers, these pesky customers. So let's start with a quick overview of what you're seeing of marketing in general in the wild. In your mind, how's the profession trending? Well, it's it's trending in the right direction. And the whole idea of, you know, customer data, ignore it at your own will. I think everybody will agree with that today, which is good. Uh, in the old days, it, it would have been at most a secondary or, or tertiary thought. Yeah, we can get to the data stuff too. So people are starting to elevate the importance of customer data, insights, and, and predictions, and so on. No one disagrees with that. Now it's a matter of taking kind of the, the wild west of, of customer insights and metrics and start to bring a little bit more rigor, standardization, accountability to it. We're making good progress there, too. Excellent. I, I would agree with that. I, what I'm seeing is everyone's making steps here, but there's they're not very consistent steps. And a lot of every one of these almost each one is its own little personalized snowflake by company. So, so the more standardized it can get, kind of the better. So, so with that as background, why don't you give our listeners an overview of customer centricity and customer lifetime value? Uh, um, sure thing. So, so just to, to take one tiny little baby step back. So, what I've been doing for all those thirty plus years at, at Warden is I just build predictive models. So, you know, uh, how many customers are we going to acquire? How long are they going to stay? How often are they going to transact or interact? How valuable will those interactions be? So, I just really enjoy uh, both building the models, telling the stories. Um, and the, the and the so what so you know what are the these these insights and forecasts how do they help us make better decisions uh, and and for years and years it, it's it's worked very well from an academic standpoint but you know you CMOs out there I mean not you personally but but mo most of them would would tend to either uh, downplay ignore dismiss it they'd say you know that that's great in the ivory tower but uh, let me tell you about the real world sunny boy uh, so I've really had to take matters into my own hands to try to make the, the the models, the metrics as relevant as possible, and then kind of surround them with a narrative to get people to really, really, really want to pay attention. So this customer centricity stuff, it really is just a, a more or less a, a facade, a Trojan horse around the models just to get practitioners to pay attention. Because I can't just say, here's a good model, that's not going to work. But if I can say, here's a strategy, here's a perspective, here's a, uh, you know, a, a series of, of intertwined tactics that can help you do your job better, that can help you gain more respect, coordinate better with, with other C-level people. So the customer centricity stuff, the notion that not all customers are created equal, and if we could double click on those differences, we can make more money in a sustainable, ethical, <laughs> defendable manner. Um, that's the customer centricity thing. Yes. And customer lifetime value is just kind of at the heart of that. So how do we know which customers to double click on and so on? Uh, and we want to do that on the basis of not just how much these customers have spent with us. That's good, too. 
uh, but how much they're likely to spend and for how long. So just just uh, looking at the, the forward-looking value of customers and then figuring out what to do with all that information. Having done this in a couple of companies, and I am, I am a 100% believer in CLTV, the real issue often becomes the predictive models can get under attack for their prediction and also the, is this customer really going to show up like this? That's that's the 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 argument I, I've run into, and I've always started out with this averaging is killing us thing because treating these customers on average pisses off the best customers. Mm -hmm. Tell us a little bit about how the models are set up, how they then can argue with someone who wants to say, well, that won't be true in two years from now when AI takes over or when I this love takes it. over. So, because this is my job is, is to not to build these models, but to convince all people that that they work, that they're relevant. So first of all, let's, let's go back 40 years. Now, what were the things I was doing before a marketer? I was a, a math major at MIT, and my primary focus was on actuarial science. I was actually taking all these exams to become an actuary. And the one job that I had, albeit just for a summer internship, was with an insurance company doing actuarial work. Uh, and then it was a professor at MIT who said, you know, you ought to take all those models and perspectives and apply them to customers instead of just, you know, um, you know, insurance risks. Uh, and she was right. Uh, and and if you think about what actuaries do, they don't they don't say, you know, how old are you going to be, Mr. Linton, when you pass away? They, they know better <laughs> than to get that granular about it. But they will say, let's look at a group of people who share the same characteristics and say what percent of them will live to be 80 years old. So they know their limitations, they develop these models over very long horizons, and they do so with great specificity and accountability. They are not afraid to say those numbers, and they don't back down. They, they don't say, well, we didn't anticipate the pandemic, or well, we didn't yeah. anticipate. Um, they, they kind of live and die by the forecast. And th that's what I've been doing, is the same exact thing, is applying actuarial science to say instead of how long till you die, how long till you buy, uh, and and then and then going out on a limb with it. That's very of, clever marketing there. Uh, and to, and to to jump ahead with it, I, I know you want to talk about this idea of CBCV, customer based corporate valuation. That's the ultimate test. Because if why, I can, why, why don't you do it? yes, explain what you just said on yep. the CV front and what it is. And then we can talk about the ultimate test because we'll just do that part right now and then we'll come back to that. Sure thing. So so the, so the idea is this, that, that if we can project how many customers you're going to acquire and how long they're going to stay and how often they're going to buy and how much you're going to spend and add that up, that's the company's revenue. And so by being uh, respectful of these models, we can do a better job of forecasting overall revenue longer into the future, more accurately, and with a better diagnostic understanding. Why is it plateauing? Is it because we're not acquiring as many customers, they're not staying as long, they're not buying as often? So we can go way out on a limb and, and start talking in, in the aggregate about, you know, how is this company doing? How will this company do? And in a lot of the published work, we go so far out of the limb to say, this is the actual value of the company. This is what their stock price should be. And this stuff is, is vetted, it's published, and then we're held accountable. So you have these papers dating back to 2017, where we said Dish Network overvalued, Sirius XM satellite radio undervalued, Wayfair overvalued, Overstock undervalued. And you look at their stock prices today, and we're right on all but those it's all, cases. I mean, that makes perfect sense, which is nothing happens if the customer doesn't give you money that's so, it but why is there so much resistance to this we're we're doing a show later uh, called uh, the battle between the believers and non-believers because marketing now has a lot more math but there still is tremendous resistance and and the and the the argument of gosh these aren't the exact financials that go into the balance sheet and everything else so we don't like them I, it, it, Talk about this sure. if so, I know you want to, so let's do it. Lots of reasons why. Uh, number one, some people feel threatened by it. You know, traditional marketers uh, are, are going to look at some of this math stuff and, and just feel that, you know, that's what, not what they do. <laughs> um, so they're going to come up with every reason, every excuse to disparage it. Um, others, uh, it's kind of a similar vein, but, but more. Um, there's a lot of people who want to humanize marketing. Yeah. I don't like that. 
Uh, and yeah, I'm the only person on the planet who's ever going to say that. There's a lot of people say, you know, behind all those numbers is a human being, flesh and blood, emotions, feelings. Well, and I basically I say, say that that's a bunch of that's a bunch too. of bull. Yeah, behind an income statement is a human being. Or, yeah, and, and, I mean, yeah. And so let's just not go there. Uh, so let's let's avoid the temptation to humanize our customers. And again, that that's 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 a that's throwing a grenade in in in, in the marketing lunchroom. Um, uh, and and we're actually better off thinking about them as just, um, you know, uh, 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 we're better off thinking about people acting as if randomly, that they're flipping a coin to decide whether to stay with this subscription or not. They're rolling a die to decide which brand to buy. They're, they're kind of spinning a wheel to decide, you know, how many tickets to buy to the next concert, whatever it might be. So thinking about behavior on an as if random basis, even though it's highly dehumanizing, it turns out to be very, very effective in terms of understanding forecasting allocating and 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 again being held accountable well it is essentially the law of large numbers particularly when you can see that kind of consumer data how about peter when you can't when you don't have that clear of a a you know, all the digital stuff you can see the consumer coming in and out you get a lot of stuff you can see them bop in and out so if I, i'm a subscription model or if I'm digital only, I, I can track you and the law of large numbers becomes easier. How about some other companies where I can't see the consumer clearly? How do I think about this model that way? I love it. So boy, oh boy, this is truly what I do for a living is, is building these statistical models to help us fill in the blanks uh, and make statements about things that just can't be observed. So so the, the number one example, a relatively simple one in, in my book, is what do we do with non-contractual businesses? Like most of those companies that you were CMO for were people just buying in a discretionary basis. And no, then at like, some point- Let's say Best, Best Buy. Best or, Buy. Yeah, Best Buy is an example. Procter. P &G. Sure, where, yeah. where people buy for a while and then for whatever reason, they no longer need the category, they move, they die, who the heck knows, they, they just stop buying it. But we never know for sure, we can never look at a customer in a non-contractual setting and know whether they're alive, alive or not, yeah. um, unlike a subscription setting. So how do we look at someone's transaction history and say, you know, you used to buy from us a lot, you haven't been around for a while, you're probably gone. Yeah. So how do we do that in a, in a way where we can actually come up with a probability and live and die by it? To say for this group of customers, their probability of being alive is, you know, 40% and then watch them for the next three years and lo and behold, 40% of them will actually do things. It's the actuarial tables to make statements about things that can't be observed. Can you give us a live example, like a real company you could talk about or a thing we could talk about? Just give us an example of that so our users can groove into what you're saying. Sure. Thing. Well, one of the beautiful things is is pretty much any discretionary setting, um, it's going to apply. So um, Hotel Chain <clears throat> just finished a wonderful project with a giant uh, a quick service restaurant chain, one that recently started a loyalty program. Uh, and <laughs> so go on name. <laughs> I'm not going to say more than that, um, but it's been just fascinating. To, now, now, in their case, it's not so much a matter of drop out. It, it's more a matter of uh, of just really understanding those who are going to buy a, a lot versus a little. Here's another one I, I have here. Um, I, again, I can't name it yet. I'm just going to kind of flash this white paper in front of you. Um, <laughs> You're just teasing everybody. I am, and, and, and I don't mean to. I really want to say the name, and hopefully by next week we'll have the green light from the company. It's a company that sells um, um, cosmetic pharmaceuticals. Okay. And so it really is the kind of thing that you will tend to use it for a while and then for various reasons, stop. So how can we determine uh, which customers have either stopped or are on the verge of stopping? And then how can we use that both to drive messaging? So which kind of message do I send to which customer based on how alive I think they are? And even at a, at a, at a higher level um, to, to basically help them sort out the clinics that administer these services, which clinics have a higher concentration of kind of locked in loyal customers and which ones they might have a lot of customers, but they tend to be more one and done. 
So, you know, how should we treat the clinics differently right. based on the, the the mix of patients and their aliveness? So lots and lots and lots of different use cases. Uh, I, also in, in pharmaceuticals. And I, just, I could, again, it's it's really fascinating to, to look at these non-contractual settings. And again, that's just the tip of the iceberg. But maybe, maybe later this year or some other time, we'll, we'll actually deconstruct a case. Um, I would love to, love um, to do that. Because I, what I hear you saying, correct me if I have this wrong, averaging is killing us, when you, but, but you are going to move to this predictive model. And then at the execution layer, for example, in this company you just mentioned, you're going to de-average everything and treat the point of sale for what it is, not what you want it to be. Is that a fair way to think about it's it? It's so fair. And the, and the problem is, as marketers, we think that we have more control of our destiny than we really do. So number one, we think we can turn those ugly ducklings into beautiful swans, that if we can just nurture them and educate them and get them to understand how awesome our products and services are, and we're exactly. going to do whatever it takes to do. <laughs> well, that's actually generally a bad idea. Um, that it's pretty hard to turn those ugly ducklings into beautiful swans, and the resources that are required to do so should be can, can be better spent elsewhere. So, number one, we have to kind of live with the fact that many of our customers are eh, and it's not really our fault. Or they might even to... not like us. They might. There's no way that whole thing you're going to if you just pound someone with great marketing, they're going to buy it. I don't think so. I could I could do the greatest marketing ever. For depends for you, but if you don't have a need, you're not buying it. That's and, exactly and, 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 so. Getting like people software. to recognize that, and and kind of in a similar vein, win back strategies. You know, we're going <laughs> to do whatever it takes. There's this myth floating around in marketing land that if we can win a customer back, they'll be even better than they were in the first place. Uh, and the problem is, number one, it's pretty hard to win them back uh, if they're truly gone. Maybe they weren't even gone. Maybe they were just taking a snooze between purchases. Um, and if and when they do come back, they're going to be pretty much the same as they were before. Um, so we we just have to kind of be a little bit more humble about the the kind of alchemy that we can do with our customers, and just uh, I, I, you know just better understand, better allocate resources, uh, and it's just going to not only lead to better outcomes, but lead to more credibility with the the CFOs and the other folks in the organization. But, but I also think that this is a super important point for marketers, and one of the things that I encourage people to think about in the interview is. If the company is trying to convince you that its product is better than it is and all it needs is marketing to fix it, unless it is really a marketing problem, you're walking into a two-year job and where, where their expectations are going to be completely misaligned with you and the math will, will likely bear you out. But so let's say you buy into this. What is the way to best way to convince your CEO, CFO, and board, particularly if they're a believer that all, all we have a great product, it, uh, consumers just don't get it. How do you convince them of this using your method? Sure. So I'll come at it in three different ways. Uh, okay. my, my favorite way would just be with the models themselves. Hey, I'm going to make some forecasts uh, and, you know, then let's just sit back and see what happens. Or let's compare, you know, let, let's take a historical data set that you have. Let's look at, you know, two years to predict over the next three and let's, you know, see how well the model does. Let's see how it compares to your own intuition or your own internal models. So number one, and, and, and foremost, I'd rather just focus on the models. That's what I like to do. But yeah. Sometimes that's not enough. Sometimes folks... Uh, say, you know what, that's great historically, but the future is very different, fine. That's when I might start to bring in the customer centricity card to say it's less about the models, but it's more about the, the tactical execution. And if we can just help you not only run the loyalty program better or the strategic account management and or, or whatever, and, and better align those things with each other. So let's just talk about the tactics, the shiny objects that you're actually playing with. Mm -hmm. And if I can I can actually convince you that that there really is a way to kind of get these things to, to, to move together. Um, sometimes that works. And then sometimes, as I mentioned before, it's let's start with the CFO. Let's start with some of this you know, kind of customer-based corporate valuation stuff. Went over the CFO, do things at this higher level, put it more at a revenue level, and then say, now that I've convinced you of that, now let's start to drill down and see what we can do more at the at the ground. That, that level. one has worked for me in a couple of places, yeah. 
Yep. Uh, and, and I found and it's interesting because I hadn't, hadn't really thought much about that approach until I, I met my co-author, co-founder, former PhD student, Dan McCarthy, former finance guy, now a marketing professor. Uh, so he really is the, the, the brains of this CBCV operation. The great thing is not only can he twirl the math uh, you know, as, as well as I can, but he knows how to put the CFO narrative on top of yeah. it. So it's really great that, that uh, uh, he can turn this way and talk to the marketers with great credibility, but he can turn that way and talk to the CFOs. It's a completely different conversation, but it's the it, same it, models it. underneath it. And that's really great. Now, uh, some of our listeners may not have very much data to get started on this. They may be in a smaller company or B2B place where they haven't collected much of this. What is your advice to them on how to get going? Yeah, yeah, that that used to be my Achilles heel. And and in some ways, it's still a bit of a limitation that, you know, I have to get enough of the data to give me the runway to, to, to be able to fit and trust the models. Uh, and if you don't have enough of it, it, that's a problem. We overcome it in several different ways. And it goes back to your earlier question about kind of, you know, filling in the blanks about things that we can't necessarily see. So, so one thing that we'll sometimes do would be the idea of data fusion is let's get data from multiple sources. Let's take the limited data that, that you have internally and let's marry it up with data that we can get from, from outside sources, like, like a credit card panel or, yeah. or some kind of other market research firm. And let's take these different bits of data, seemingly disconnected and unrelated, and, and build a, a single model that can really weave them together. Again, the math on it is horrendous, which is good. It keeps me employed. Um, but but that stuff will work quite well. That's that's number one. But go ahead, Mike. Wait, I, I, I want to make sure, because right, I think this is a very important point. Within there, I hear you say, get started with whatever you have, because that's how you get better. Don't wait till you have a perfect database because one, at, at this stage, you'll never have it. And two, you will never have any conclusions while you're waiting. So you should get started some way. Is that fair? And let me, I, I, I couldn't agree more. And let me take it a step further. Let's say you don't have any data or, or you can't pull enough of these different data sets together. Find some proxy measure for it. So, and so I have no problem if you wanted to use, let's say, a net promoter score survey or a credit score or just something that lets, lets you size up customers and say, huh, some are better than others. It might not perfectly align with lifetime value, but A, it often does. And B, let's at least get started on sorting out our customers on some kind of credible dimension, understanding what makes the good ones different and how to, you know, here I go again, double click on them, clone them, acquire more like them. So even if we use some kind of proxy measure that might have no transaction log data, no behavior at all in it, yeah. um, just to kind of learn the steps of the dance while you go setting up, if you can, the CRM systems and all that kind of stuff in order to to do it with with kind of even richer and better data. I'm really good with, with using proxy measures if that's what it takes to, to get you out of the gate. So I hear beneath this comment, get started any way you can because you can't build the database by talking about it. That's right. So, and, and in some what? sense, by getting going with it, even if it is with some kind of proxy, um, it's going to teach you more about what kinds of uh, things you want to put into the database. You know, too many companies just turn to the people in IT and say, build us a CRM system, and then we'll Which figure is, it out later it's, on. It's, I love IT, and we had a, a couple IT shows, but yes. They will build exactly what you tell them, but if you give them authority, they'll do their best, but it will be wrong. Uh, exactly. You have to have user case. You have to have use cases. Uh, uh, yeah, so you got to know what you're looking for, and that's why you know trying it out, even on some you know limited kind of data, just to, to get a better sense of uh, hey, IT people, you know, as you're building it out, let's prioritize this instead of that. Uh, so that's that's one of the reasons to really get going. It, it's as much kind of internal to figure this stuff out as it is external to start, you know, showing the love to the right customers. Thank you for that sidebar on, on, on uh, smaller companies. Now, when you look down the road, because you, you're talking to a ton of companies, you're right in the front of a lot of things. What's coming down the road for marketers? I mean, we got AI, we got fragmented media, we have all this stuff. Um, and what should they be doing to prepare? 
Well, uh, so it, when it comes, let's start. Go back to the data. I mean, that's where we started yeah. with, uh, and there it's kind of the 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 best and worst of all worlds. That that obviously there's just so much more data coming available. Uh, uh, my, my son just got the the Apple Vision Pro. It's such an amazing device. You know, not only in terms of you know entertainment value and spatial computing. But the kinds of things that we can track about individuals now to know exactly right. what they're looking at and what they're clicking on, it's unbelievable. So on one hand, we're getting so much more richer data, not to mention uh, uh, things that are happening with neuroscience to know what's happening inside the brain and to tie that with what people are actually doing. But on the other hand, we're having all of this GDPR, all right, and all these different kinds of data limitation things, whether it's through uh, a, a regulatory issues or, yeah, or GDPR just, is privacy for everybody. Exactly. So, yeah. so whether it's it's a uh, it's responding to regulators or companies just making promises to the customers that we're not going to save that, we're not going to track you. Um, so, on one hand, we're getting better data. On one hand, we're getting worse data. So, you know, how do we find that just right balance, both to harness the really good rich data that's coming Coming available, but to also fill in the blanks on the kind of data that we used to have, but we can no longer get. Uh, so, so I spent a lot of time looking at these these different data sources and thinking about which kinds are I wish I had more of that, <laughs> and which kinds are you know eh whatever you know no, no big deal that we don't have that anymore. Uh, so part of it is having just much more data discipline. Uh, and I think in, in some sense, that's a theme that underlies like uh, all of the different things that you mentioned. You're talking about uh, AI and so on. Uh, again, it gives us just, just a richness of possibilities. But in some cases, they, they, the cart's getting before the horse. In some cases, there's a lot of stuff that's nice to know instead of need to know. So let's be really disciplined about it. So I, I, I appreciate that. We had Bob uh, Leo Dice from the CEO of the ANA on, and what he said is the technology and the data are outrunning any one person's ability even to you understand them, much less use them. So what I hear in your message is consistent with Bob's comment, gosh, you got to figure out what data matters the most to you and make sure you're using it right before you try and absorb every single piece of it. And I want to just, if I may, just, just go one step further with it, because Anyone's going to agree with that. It's kind of a motherhood <laughs> statement. But I'm trying to go a step you further. You didn't say, Bob, did you? The uh, <laughs> uh, well, well, the thing is, you know, Bob and I have some very good conversations about the same thing. It's not a coincidence. Um, so I'm just, and I'm not here to sell books or anything like that. But I'm trying to take this idea: what data do we really? need to know. Um, and so, you know, my my most recent book, The Customer Base Audit, um, I mean, that that's the whole idea behind it. Is, is it, So we have all of this data, which bits are we going to prioritize? How are we going to look at it? And how can we do so in just a really standard, boring way that, you know, that every quarter we're going to do these analyses with these data. We're going to hope that there's nothing interesting going on, just like when you go to the doctor, yeah. um, but it's going to give us an early warning sign about where we're seeing changes, whether it's with respect to certain customers, certain geographies, certain products. Um, so let's just do the same boring analyses over and over and over in order to to understand uh, the, 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 the nature and impact of changes. So we're really, really serious about kind of starting small, starting limited, and then starting to expand from there. Got it. Uh, I know you're going to send me a signed copy of that book. Um, the, um, the, so speaking of books, are we teaching future marketers the right things in business school today? Mixed, mixed. Tell me uh, so on one hand, there's so much more interested in the data and analytics and all the stuff that I do, all the things I've been talking about here. I've been teaching a course on this stuff for you know 20 years. I used to be lucky if I'd get you know 15, 20 uh, uh, MBAs in there, and today I'll have you know 230. So so part of it is that there's you know just all the cool kids want to do the data analytics thing. Uh, marketing is is a natural domain to kind of flex those muscles and 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 use those skills. So uh, on one hand, that's great, and it's good to see the students flocking to those courses. On the other hand, if you look at our intro courses, they're not that much different than they were when I started thirty something years ago, yeah. and we're still teaching the four P's and the eleven C's and just all this other stuff. And and I'm not saying that that stuff is wrong, but it does reflect a different era of marketing. Um, where where just the, the 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 practice was was entirely different and 
I mean, my own bias on it is that we're we're, we're still overemphasizing the role of the stuff we sell as opposed to the entities that we're selling to. I wish it was just a little bit more balance on the customer part. I couldn't agree more on that. And I also think the soft skills and the leadership and things like vendor management and uh, uh, all that, that is being not trained by anybody and the skills that will make or break you. And so, well, we, I have a whole, line of thinking on what b school yeah I, 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 I hate to and i look i love wharton i love what we do we teach some awesome courses but we don't teach a course on sales i mean how can, how can be a marketing department i can get an mba without learning how to sell and acknowledging that no matter what a field you go into whether you're a marketing major or not everyone ends up selling stuff whether it's products or ideas least, you're selling ideas right. in your company and you should know how to do it and and we should be offering courses like that so you're, you're absolutely right that that there, there's some gaps in the curriculum again there's a lot of good stuff too um, yeah. but we should be looking more at, at what is it that our students really want as opposed to what is it that we find interesting to, to teach them got it so we're at, at the end of the show this has been a blast but so last question Practical advice for our listeners and or funniest story you can share on the air. You can take both or either one of those questions, but you have to take at least one. Okay. Well, look, I, I, I love giving uh, practical advice uh, out there. And so uh, l- l- let me let me offer a, a couple of things. Uh, n- number one, uh, th- th- those numbers, those models, they're really your friend. Uh, and, and even if, if you hadn't learned them in school, and even if you haven't made that a, a big part of, of your uh, activities as a practitioner, um, it, it's never too late to learn. Uh, that, they, that that not only can these things be very helpful, but in some cases they can be actually surprisingly interesting. Uh, so in many ways, it's just like learning a, another language or a musical instrument, and you kind of have to go into it feeling kind of humbled and just knowing you're going to screw it up at the beginning. But you'd be surprised at, at what you can get good at. You you can teach an old dog new tricks. Um, so that, that's a that, that that that's one bit of of, of practical advice. Uh, and now I'm almost going to contradict myself, which is to say that a lot of these models really are they're not an end unto themselves. They're, they're just going to help us do all of that traditional marketing stuff a little bit better. So I still have tremendous respect for the creatives out there. But it's just that instead of saying, hey, creatives, just give us a great ad or develop a great product, it's, hey, creatives, we have some really valuable customers over here. Come up with something for them. So we can really find a way to take all of this quantity stuff and marry it with the kind of traditional qualitative creative stuff. uh, And everybody gains, including the customer, including the shareholder. uh, We just have to have that kind of conversation more often. I think that is a great way to end the show. And I, I'm going to summarize what you just said is, look, numbers are your friend and you should treat them as such, but you still have to lead the department and the company into the marketplace. And if, if I got that wrong, you should stop me. If not, I'm going to run to the close of the show. So uh, the thank you, Peter. It was a blast to have you on the air. And thanks everyone for listening to CMO Confidential. Uh, If you're enjoying the show, hit the like button and subscribe. Look for all of our shows on Spotify, Apple, and YouTube, which include marketing, the battle between believers and non-believers, the Budweiser case, how not to manage a socio-political issue, what private equity really thinks about marketing, and is the CMO job headed for extinction? Hey, all you marketers. Stay safe out there. This is Mike Linton signing off for CMO Confidential.